So I want to say, so today is our last ideas from the field for uh, this year. So we're going to be starting back. We'll probably take a little bit of January um, off to recruit some uh, presenters for the spring. Uh, so look for our uh, webinars to pick up again, uh, maybe end of January, 1st of February. But today is our, is our last one for 2020. Uh, bringing Conversation Clubs to Zoom. We're going to hear from Mike Godown, and he's going to talk about how he implemented uh, Conversation Clubs, and he was doing them in person, and then when the pandemic hit, brought them over to Zoom, and has found that to be a, a really a good environment to do Conversation Clubs, and he's going to share his uh, insights with us. So just to remind everyone, we are recording. So I know this is always a concern. You'll get a follow-up email. Typically, we try to have it out on Monday unless I run into issues uh, with editing the recording. That happened last week. Um, but in that uh, follow-up email, you'll get a link to the webinar recording. It'll be uploaded to YouTube. You'll get a link to the slideshow that Mike has. You'll get a little uh, PDF that has a summary of the presentation, kind of the key points and links to the resources as well as a transcript of the chat and the Q&A and a certificate to show you uh, attended the webinar. A little bit about the Zoom controls. So you should see a black bar down at the bottom. Uh, we're going to ask you to use the chat to introduce yourself as you've been doing. Uh, it's going to be the place where we share links that Mike uh, talks about. So as he's talking about them, I'll try to post those links into the chat so you can pull up the same resources that he's talking about. If you want to ask uh, questions to your you know, fellow attendees, you can do that in the chat as well. We're going to ask that if you have content questions for Mike, uh, to post those in the Q&A. Uh, that lets us ask Mike those questions and make sure everybody's questions gets answered. And Mike has been gracious enough to agree to stick around after the webinar is over to make sure everybody's question uh, gets answered. So uh, make sure to post your, your content questions into the Q&A. Makes it easier for us to track. Um, to keep track of our webinar schedule, we've had a, a robust schedule for this fall. You can go to proliteracy.org webinars, and there's where we will post in a calendar um, our webinar schedule. You can see general webinars as well as webinars from New Readers Press and uh, webinars specifically for members. And what we do is once a webinar is over, we'll link to the, in that webinar description, we'll link to the webinar recording on YouTube. So you can go back and look at previous webinars as well. As I said, our upcoming webinar schedule, we've got one more that's not part of this series, but it's on our advocacy toolkit that we just released. Uh, there's going to be some folks that actually talking about their advocacy campaigns. So if that's something of interest to you, uh, uh, I think there's an email uh, invitation going out yesterday or today. Uh, we'll probably send a reminder on Monday for that, but you can also link to it on the uh, webinars page. And then in January, we have uh, two more courses that we're launching that are part of our adult literacy management and leadership training. So we're going to have a webinar on January 7th about those. So that's about us. Now I want to turn things over to Mike. Mike is a uh, volunteer tutor with Literacy Services of Indian River County in Vero Beach, Florida. And uh, Mike, we're excited to hear what you have to say today. So I'm going to stop sharing and Mike is going to share his screen. All right, Mike, I think it's all you. OK, welcome, everyone. Um, I have attended several of these um, webinars. And I have enjoyed them very much, uh, which is a reason that I volunteered to kind of give my opinions, uh, lessons learned, philosophy, 
uh, whatever you want to call it, all the things that have been shared with me by many other tutors and um, just tell you a little bit about the conversation uh, club that we have um, here in Vero Beach. To talk a little bit about literacy services, uh, I first started volunteering with literacy services here about three years ago. And, and like probably many of the programs that you folks are connected to out there, um, they have a wide range of services. They do um, adult basic education, they do GED prep, um, they do ESL services, um, and they also um, do citizenship um, test preparation as well. And in terms of size, uh, you know, and I haven't seen the latest numbers, but we're probably um, 100 plus tutors and several hundred students um, throughout Indian River County. Uh, and just to tell you um, a little bit about myself, what my background is, um, my professional background was that I worked with for GE uh, my entire career. Uh, and I, I, I took an early retirement. And when I did that, uh, I was, I always enjoyed um, teaching and I enjoyed interfacing with teachers, um, you know, kind of a lifelong learning type um, opportunity. And where I was at, I was working in Washington DC area at the time and the Lado School, um, which is in Washington DC, which is named after Dr. Lado, um, who helped with the linguistics program or established the linguistics program at Georgetown. Um, they had a school there uh, that his family, I think, had founded, and they provided TEFL um, certification in an intensive um, month-long program where you basically learn from experienced and excellent instructors in the morning, and you got to kind of work those things uh, and, and actually get in front of students in the afternoon and then get immediate feedback. And so I actually taught students from uh, nearby uh, universities uh, as well as embassy personnel. So I might be teaching a class from four, five, six, seven different countries um, and a variety of students. And that was just a great foundation for me. Um, and by accident, I became connected with a Thai temple um, from Thailand, uh, um, just like a, a couple miles from my home. And they needed help learning English because mo all of them were Thai who worked there and they had a lot of um, challenges in, in administrative things with either the county, the state, federal, and they needed someone to help improve their English. And as a result of that, they asked me if I would teach at some of their schools in Thailand because they knew that I was going to be doing volunteering. And so for a number of years, uh, probably about eight years, I actually traveled around Thailand. I made one to several trips over there a year. And I taught initially primary uh, students, uh, but found that I did not have the patience to teach primary grades. It took more patience than what I had. And I ended up teaching more towards high school age level students. I got paired with two government teachers who had each taught in excess of 30 years. And they helped develop my sensitivities to the Thai culture and understand that if I wanted to get the students attention, it had to be something fun, okay? These, they were not as serious perhaps as our students and they were best connected to the material when it was a fun process. And uh, so I actually traveled to a variety of schools and probably the, the largest number of types of schools that I taught at were interestingly enough, they were Buddhist monks and they were becoming teachers and they may go into the country areas and teach. And many of these schools had, as I'm sure you may have seen in your travels, they had what they called an English teacher, but that English teacher did not necessarily speak English. They taught grammar 
and focused on grammar. So this was the student's opportunity to talk and have a conversation with somebody who um, spoke English. And uh, they, some of them had never talked to a Westerner before. So there was an intense interest on their part, part to converse in English. And it was fascinating to see. Um, I enjoyed that um, for, for, for the entire time I did it. And um, when I later moved to Indian River County here in Florida, uh, I, I became connected to um, literacy services. And I started out doing a workplace ESL. I had two professional folks uh, who were in management positions, but needed kind of business help in communicating with their workers as well as other management. And uh, so I worked with those folks and, um, you know, it was great to see because they made amazing strides. Um, uh, very proud of both of them. They had several other dedicated tutors who each helped them with something slightly different. One might be personal issues, another one might be um, childcare or school issues. And I was helping them with their business uh, and, and speaking skills. Um, I also did one-on-one -on -one, one tutoring. And I taught a number of students one-on-one um, -on -one tutoring. And then I also volunteered to help uh, as a tutor mentor um, um, when literacy services established that program. And we have helped develop the in-service training. And we also uh, helped uh, any tutor who had challenges that they needed some recommendations or some suggestions on. And that was a very enjoyable process as well. And in 2019, I asked to begin what I will call a conversation club. And I was kind of triggered by, by it because this was my interest anyway. It had always been my interest in focusing on conversation. And I am also grateful to the Florida Literacy Coalition because they had some excellent videos that got me started. And let me tell you a little bit about the Conversation Club. Um, it started as an experiment, um, as a way to address the need for intermediate to advanced level students to truly practice their English conversation skills. Because many of these folks had either had previous ESL class, they may have been to the local college and had ESL classes, uh, they may have, they were currently studying citizenship, but many of their personal interactions were not opportunities to practice English. Perhaps their family uh, was not bilingual, perhaps their spouse was not speaking English or supportive um, of, of that. Um, they, they had limited interaction to actually practice. So this was an opportunity and I had the support of literacy services to go through with this experiment and give it a try. I want to talk a little bit about my, what I'll call my philosophy. And, you know, we all have our own toolkits. We've all developed kind of our own approaches to teaching. And, and we may teach different things. Uh, I have, through my experience, uh, in my opinion, um, I think it's a matter of, at least for the students that I teach, it's ensuring we have the right opportunity for them. It's about then building their confidence. And that is what gets them engaged. And in terms of the right opportunity, I always try to have a warm up and let them feel that they're successful in the beginning of the class and that they can do this. I also try to be clear about the goals and questions um, when I do it, although sometimes that's a challenge when you're multitasking on Zoom. But 
Um, I think we do a pretty good job of that. And I try to use my past experience to ensure that they have a fun time, that there's a variety of things we do, and because I want them to come back. I want them to feel that this is something they want to do. In terms of confidence, it's also very important that I, as the teacher, and it's actually more of a facilitator, I have to show that I have faith in the student. I project that they can do this. I also develop a personal rapport with the student. I know about their background. I know about their family. I know about their professional, um, what they do as a profession, um, how they feel about things. And I, that's an important part of it as well, because um, not only do I want kind of to bond with them in this way, I also want them to bond with each other because then they will all be supportive of each other. And it is almost like their own network of students who are in a similar situation. And it's very powerful for them. And it also ensures that our group, our club is something they will wanna keep coming back to because it's a supportive type thing. And it's been especially important during the pandemic because all of us have had challenges of remaining connected to other people um, for our own mental health. And this is an opportunity to help them in that regard. I also always welcome visitors because visitors are a great opportunity for them to hear other people speak, for them to practice asking questions, what are the question words? Practice them. And it's also good publicity for literacy services, to, for people to see their students, to see what they do with the community, how they support and grow the community. And so I always um, support visitors and it's worked out great. The end result of all this is that we get a lot of engagement. Believe me, the 80% student talk is not a problem in a conversation class. Um, it's not always 80%, you know, sometimes my modeling uh, may be a little heavier in one class than another. I also operate the class on a rotating participation. That means that I don't always choose the student who can best answer the question. Uh, I don't, you know, put anyone under any particular pressure. They know and they have the expectation that I want them to contribute. I want them all to give contribute. Now, sometimes on Zoom, <laughs> they all contribute at once, but that's the challenge. And uh, I, I don't discourage that. I let them go at it and it's great to see. Um, and I also have a consistent meeting time and with Zoom, you know, they have a link. I keep that link uh, for them and it's the same link. And I send out a text and I let them know Hey, we're meeting Tuesday at four o'clock. See you then. Sometimes a little late, few latecomers, I send them a reminder text. But this is also very convenient for both them and me in the pandemic situation. Because by using Zoom, I don't have to go anywhere. I don't have to reserve a room. I don't have to worry about them being late. They don't have to find transportation. They don't have to worry about childcare. Many, many good things, I think, that make it very adaptable to the pandemic. And quite honestly, I think Zoom is a much better method of communication, the media to use um, for Conversation Club. So it's been great from that perspective. And I knew nothing about Zoom, say, in March or February. I mean, I never used it, didn't know what it was heard about WhatsApp, and now I teach others how to use it. So it's been a great learning process. Talk a little bit about my approach. Um, there's a couple unusual methods that perhaps are different from your tutoring, um, literacy tutoring that you folks do. Uh, first of all, the method is I focus on listening skills versus written material. 
And the main reason I do that is I don't want them to be distracted. I want them to listen. I want them to respond. I don't allow or I don't promote dictionaries, translators, and I don't use a whiteboard. Again, I want the focus on listening and interacting. I try as best I can to use carefully phrased questions because in doing this, I want to encourage students to do different language exercises. I want them to give opinions. I want them to state preferences. I want them to describe their beliefs. It, it's a deeper dive into the use of the English language than, this, than just this is a red apple. It's, it's much more difficult for them, but when you engage them, it's amazing what they can do. I also really have worked over time to ensure that I provide context. As a matter of fact, I ask them sometimes to define context, to keep that in their mind. Uh, and, and I keep a simple explanation. I just tell them, you know, it's your surrounding things going on. You want to hear the music along with the words. Because if you're put in the right frame of mind and you know what the subject is, you are much more confident, you are much more able to elicit things and to use the language. So that results in a quicker understanding and engagement. Another thing that you are going to see in this presentation is I make strong use of visual content. In my classes, it's probably 70 to 80% visual content. And I'll tell you a little bit about what that is, but it's, it helps tremendously in setting the context and the background. And then I ask, shoot questions at them and it, you'll see, I'm gonna show you a little clip about this. Um, but I also invite you at any time during this to add anything that you may have in your toolkit that would help other people in facilitating conversation with literacy students. Because one of the added, I think, benefits of these webinars is that the material that others share is a great resource to come back to. So please put stuff in the chat. Feel free to do that throughout this talk. So the visual content really helps them identify action that's going on, objects, as well as symbols. I borrowed this page on the left from the Florida Literacy um, Coalition, and it was in one of their um, webinars that I attended. And the object here was that there are many things that we talk to students about in conversation, in English conversation, that are fairly typical. They are perhaps maybe uh, a, an easy type of thing to discuss with the students, but they are the tip of the iceberg. There are many, many other deeper topics that we can ask about how they feel that allows them to really master the English language in communicating all kinds of things other than just yes and no. So I encourage you to look at this sometimes and, and it's a great opportunity to think of things uh, that you can ask your students about. And one of the ways, uh, tools that I use to kind of get them started sometimes is Kathy's cards. And uh, our literacy office had a box of these and what they're really nice is they're 270 cue cards and they're designed um, that they can kind of have the student ask a, a personal, you know, answer a personal question, uh, something that is important to them, something that they have an opinion on. And they're fun, they're, they're comical sometimes. Um, you know, the students chuckle at some of them, uh, like I have asked them, okay, here's the question. Should you marry for love or money? The students get a kick out of that. Um, the cards are like $50. 
Um, there's a link later on uh, to, uh, uh, to, to getting them. Uh, I actually hold the card up. I ask the question, I hold the card up to my camera so that they can see it. And they're very helpful as kind of an easy go-to. One of our programs at Literacy Services um, in, one, in one of our in-service elements was to have the program manager for the school programs come in to um, talk to us about how she got student visitors to the museum um, to use language. And that really helped me focus on visual literacy. And the basic definition is the ability to read, write, and create visual images. And um, I, I look at it that it is an enjoyable way to use language, to quickly identify context, to increase vocabulary, to compare and contrast, to imagine, and to express more abstract thoughts. And so I almost always use art that I typically get off the internet or out of an art book, um, you know, a, a museum website, um, but I use it in my class. And I'm going to show you a little bit how I use it in my class. Here's an example. It's one of my favorite paintings from the Phillips Collection uh, in Washington DC Museum. I put this picture up on Zoom for the students and I asked them a series of questions. So take a moment and think what questions could you ask students about this scene? And think about some of those softer issues. Think about what's the mood. If you have some beginner students, ask them, what colors do you see? If you want to ask them, what time period do you think this picture was from? Are all the people, how are they dressed? What's different? about some of the people and the way they're dressed. There's many, many different questions. The Vero Beach Art Museum uh, has in their collection some of the paintings by the highwaymen. And this is a typical Florida scene um, that was painted by a highwayman. Um, and they suggest that one of the interesting ways to really engage your students is to talk about the five senses and imagine how your five senses are affected um, in imagining things about this painting. So you can talk about sight, you can talk about sounds, you could ask them to imagine what do some of the things that you might see in the picture feel or if you touch them, what do they feel like? What kind of tastes do you think of when you're at a beach? What are the smells? How do you describe them? There's many, many, you know, you can just, it's, it's almost like an infinite number of things um, that you can ask the students about this. And the objective is that you are going from an image to words and you're encouraging them to use words. This was our Thanksgiving exercise. I went out on the internet. I got a Norman Rockwell painting that's on the right um, of uh, a scene, typical Americana scene of Thanksgiving. And I went out and got a quite different uh, picture uh, on the left. And then I asked the students, what is different? And we had a lot of fun with this. And it's a very simple thing, you know, it's two pictures. Um, and yet, if you look at it and you start talking about the things that are different, it's amazing. 
the differences that you know they notice and they can spot and now they have to describe them so they enjoy it they have fun with it they don't even think that they're using language you know it just comes so automatic because they're focused on what they're seeing not on an answer uh, a fill in uh, the way maybe a lot of normal um, literacy lessons flow. So I find that the students enjoy this and I enjoy it because I can have a lot of fun with it. Um, and there's always things that's funny with what they notice. I would now like to show you another thing that I do, which is a context exercise. And it's just something I made, kind of made up to go through with the students. And so we start out by describing the definition of the word context. What do we mean by it? And then I ask the students to guess the place or the topic as they hear a short list of words. So here is a list of words, appointment, waiting room, insurance, examination, thermometer, and you can probably think of more. But their challenge is after they think of, they identify it, and they would identify it as, let's say, a doctor's office. I then ask them more questions. Okay, we'll name some other things that you would see in the doctor's office. How would you feel if you were in the waiting room of a doctor's office? Uh, and, and again, it's, it's words that they see and now they're imagining an image and they're coming up with more words. Now I wanna kind of give you the context this time and I'm gonna share a video uh, of uh, a recent recording of my students and um, the students just finished this context game of the doctor's office that I showed you in the previous example. And I'm starting a second and a different context game with them. And I will share words for them to identify the activity. And then after they correctly identify the activity from the context, I then move to a related image for them to practice comparing and contrasting two images. And this is kind of in the, maybe just beyond the initial warm up stage of my class. And uh, this is gonna give you uh, kind of an idea of how um, the class works. So Mike, I think you need to hit escape. Yeah, I did. It didn't react. There we go. Oh, I think you, no. Okay. Um, it, uh, let's see. How about if I, I'll uh, stop share for a second. Stop share for a second. And I will uh, then do escape. And I will then uh, go to my video. And then reshare. And then reshare. That should work. We'll see here in a second. Get the computer sound so you folks can hear it well. Here we go. Um, now the next one um, is one that um, all of us have one of these. Once a year we have it. What the, sorry? This is something that happens for each of us one time a year. One time a year? Look at the 
Physical, physical examen. Okay, it's it's not related no. to medical. It's something. Uh, I'm going to give you um, another hint. Many of you, when you have this time, you have a cake. You mm -hmm. have a cake. Uh, birthday. 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 Yeah, a baby shower is one thing, yes, but hopefully ho hopefully not once a year. <laughs> it's nine months. <laughs> um, now, if you have many people who come to your birthday, what do we call that? Uh, uh, guest. Yeah. Guest. Okay. Uh, and what 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 uh, what are they invited to? They are invited to your birthday party. Friends. Birthday party. Very good. Yeah. Very good. It's a birthday party. Okay. What are some things that you would see at a birthday party? Mm. Decoration. Okay. Candle. Candles, okay. Mm -hmm. Where would the candles be? The on the cake. cake. Okay. On the cake, okay. Candles on the cake, okay. Um, Drinks? What else do you do at a birthday party? Drinks? Drinks? Drinks on the course. Beers. Whiskey. Music. M music. Yeah, okay. music. 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 And, and, and if you have beer and drinks and a cake and music. Presents. Presents. Very good, everyone. Presents. And Thank who you. who brings those presents? The friends. The quest. <laughs> friends. Yes. Uh, friends and also friends and something else. Families. Family. Oh. Friends and family. family. It's not. Okay, so now I'm going to show you a picture here, okay? I'm going to share my screen, and uh, I'm going to show uh, all of you a picture, and there's going to be... Okay, now, here are two birthday parties. Two birthday parties, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, can you tell me how are the birthday parties different? Yeah, the children. One is for children, one is for adults. Oh, very good. One is with children and one okay. for adults. All of it. Okay, what else is different? Uh, the uh, children's parties, uh, like, it's happy. Informal. Playing. I'm sorry, what did you say, Victor? Um, the children's party is informal and the uh, adults' party is like a formal party. Uh. Very good, very good. The yes. children's party is informal. Uh -huh. uh, they are in, in everyday clothes and the adult party is formal. Yes. How do we know it is formal? From their dress. From the way they are dressed. And how are they dressed differently? Um, they dress really formally and the dress. Uh, men are wearing, uh, wearing suits. Yes, the men very good. Yes. The men are wearing suits. Suits. And suits. what else do they have uh, in addition to wearing a suit? Um Tie. Ties. Very good. Yes, they also tie, have... Tie, then a tie, mm -hmm. suit, uh, uh, gla sunglasses. Sunglasses, yeah, glasses. Yes. Sunglasses. What about, what about the women? How are the women dressed differently? Mm. Also. Shoes. Black. Yeah. 
So that gives you a little bit of idea um, how um, this particular uh, class uh, proceeds and, and hopefully gives you um, some ideas about how in a warm up stage you get the students to interact. I also want to share with you a variety of activities um, and some of these I've described, but this is kind of a list of things that I've used. Hey, Mike, uh, yes. you need to reshare your PowerPoint. Uh, okay. Perfect. There we go. So here's the variety of activities. I mentioned Kathy's cards. I talked about the art engagement. I, I described the context game. I've also done surveys with the students. Whenever any organization wants to do surveys of the students, whether it be for the census, whether it be for some kind of a health initiative. Uh, I am always happy to have people come in and present and do a survey with the students because it's an excellent way for the students to hear other people interact with them. Also with guests, I do a 20 questions game and it's quite humorous sometimes because they have to phrase the question so that the guest can answer the question with just a yes or a no answer. And I will tell you that if one of the students sometimes phrases it the wrong way, some of the other students are quick to tell them in both English and Spanish that, no, you have to do it so that the person can only answer yes or no. And that's a great thing with guests. And as a matter of fact, uh, a recent guest that Literacy Services connected uh, with my group, she was working on her master's in ESL, in English ESL, and she wanted to see an actual class in action. And so I had her as a guest and <laughs> the students uh, found out um, what she was there for and what she was going to do in less than 20 questions. So it's, it's really amazing to see uh, we also use music and we use YouTube videos that show the lyrics. I might ask them their favorite songs and then I pull up the song on YouTube. I try to find a YouTube video with the lyrics. And what's always interesting to me is that the students love practicing listening too. You know, we emphasize conversation but the students also want practice listening. And because they don't always get that in a, a typical grammar class. And one of the things that you can also do with a YouTube video that I do sometimes, if the lyrics are a little too fast, I go to the settings and just turn it down to 75%. And, you know, the music sounds roughly the same, uh, but they can hear the words better and follow it. And then I'll speed it up again for them once they've heard it, okay? And I don't know if any of you have read articles on it, but they found that, you know, sometimes once the brain hears something, uh, you know, like that, it, and, and then it's played faster, even if they don't hear it, it's like the brain fills in the blanks. And they, it's amazing how they can comprehend the song after that process. And it's a great discussion tool. Uh, the student also sometimes comes with special requests. I always ask them what their goals are. And in discussing those goals, if it's a job interview, we may practice that. We had a student who was a doctor and he was becoming a nurse in the US and he needed practice on medical terms. So, you know, we would practice those with the students and, you know, one would role play a nurse, the other would ro role play a doctor and the other would be a patient. And we would practice some of the words 
that you might typically hear in that setting. And sometimes they need phone skills. You know, we, we had a student who was an Uber driver and he said, you know, if somebody calls me and then they tell me their address, it's very difficult for me to hear, especially on the vowels, because in Spanish, the sound of the vowels is distinctly different. I, I need practice on when I hear that vowel in English, immediately getting better at converting what vowel that is. We also use um, the Easy English News, and that's great for reading. Uh, sometimes they have great um, uh, kind of letters to the editor. And if you're not familiar with English, Easy English News, um, the students here uh, locally get it within certain times a year. And you can also get a digital copy of it. And, um, you know, it, it has a lot of content, a lot of different content. And this is just some of the examples of that content. So please, uh, into the chat, please feel free to add uh, some of the tools that you use in getting your students to have uh, a conversation in your classes. Uh, I'd be interested in knowing and, and, and if you were able to share uh, some of those. Now, there are challenges. And I think some of these challenges are the same in any ESL type class, uh, but they all can be addressed. And, you know, one of the challenges is sometimes we may have a variety of student skill levels. And sometimes what I do in that is I may vary the questions when I reach that person. You know, I may start out with colors instead of, you know, an abstract thought. Um, another challenge is having an adequate class size. Um, and, and I depend on the support of literacy services to kind of channel these students to me. And um, that's really important because if you only have two people in a class versus eight or 10 or 12, two people is a lot more difficult to have a fun, interactive class. The more you have, the more interactive it is, and the more benefit it is to the students. We also have a fairly flexible time schedule, and so the timing of entry sometimes varies in the class. We may have someone who works, class starts at 4, they get off at 4.30, they come on right away, and so there's some challenges to that, but we, we make it work. Um, and it's also sometimes difficult on Zoom um, to hear and follow the students' conversation um, because uh, some of us may have hearing problems, they may speak softly, um, but that is a challenge. And sometimes there's background noise because I, I allow them, for example, you know, you can't mute a conversation club. Uh, so. I allow them to also have their children there. Uh, I had a student um, several months ago who was with us about a year and she always had her son there because she was just starting English. She needed a little help. So her son participated and we made it fun and the other class members liked to see him. And I was very happy that she graduated and she actually had got her confidence to the level that she was going to take classes at the local state college. So, you know, it's, it's one of those things where we hate to lose a student, but as long as it's in progress, it's great to see. Another challenge is some of the technical skills, because in order to multitask the class, you know, sharing screens, muting, unmuting, new students coming in, admitting them, um, putting pictures up, uh, having the questions uh, to ask uh, at your fingertips, it, it can be a challenge. And that, that brings me to two other things that are related to some extent, and that is, you know, the student internet access and support is also can be a challenge. 
Uh, I know Literacy Services has recently addressed this challenge uh, by getting some hotspot and um, loanable um, laptops. And that has helped tremendously because, you know, although they can reach me via the phone on a Zoom, it's much better to have them on a laptop and easier. Another thing that's a challenge is that a lot of this, I use an impromptu teaching style. So this method of teaching is not for everyone. It, some folks may have a much more difficult time doing it than others. Uh, it, you know, if someone is used to teaching from a book, show me what to use, I can use it. They may have a more difficult time facilitating a conversation. Um, but I have had folks who have attended my conversation class um, just to kind of see how I do it to learn from that. And I'm always happy to share and help anyone in that regard um, because we all learn. And, and, and it helps the more people we have interacting with these students, the better it is for them. There's also, especially for the teachers, there's a fear of silence. That is that we may be concerned that folks won't respond. And again, this is not necessarily bad because sometimes um, they may need some time to formulate their thoughts. Uh, but quite honestly, I have not found this to be a problem with my students. As long as I have a large enough number, they interact. And um, I, I don't worry. I, I keep firing questions at them because I want them to be engaged, but it's not really a problem at all. So for me, uh, the rewards far outweigh the challenges. And I'm sure all of you feel the same way with your students. I just want to give a credit to a few of the sources. Um, I did, you know, the Florida Literacy Coalition. If you have any opportunities to um, sign up for any of their webinars, I strongly uh, endorse the kinds of programs that they have shared with us uh, and that I have attended. They, they just do, they always do a great job and I always learn something from their webinars just as I do uh, this. In addition to the Vero Beach Art Museum, I use them as an example, but I suggest you check with your local museums because many times they have experts in and even online programs um, to do a virtual tour or things about um, virtual literacy. If any of you decide to uh, go through the program at LABO, um, I did it like 15 years ago, but it was an excellent program then, and I'm sure it still is. Uh, I know it's still active. There's a lot of interesting reading about visual literacy um, because this is a topic that is also of interest to current educators because students are not inclined to read like we did when we grew up. Matter of fact, a, a recent teacher said to me, we're lucky if we can get them to read an email, let alone a book. And so there's some very interesting things that you can both be used for a conversation club. And also it's, it's just interesting to know that where society is heading in this regard. And also um, Philip's collection has a lot of online uh, pictures and as many museums do, um, but you know, you can just Google art, you can Google a topic, you'll come up with images and you know, you can just drop, copy those, drop them into a Word document and you've got a page to share for your next class. So uh, in the other um, things that uh, hopefully Todd has been putting out in the chat is some other things that I've used in the past. Um, and, uh, you know, there are examples of where you can go and there's many more uh, as well. So I think now uh, we have uh, an opportunity for some questions. And, Absolutely. 
Um, and Mike, we have a lot of questions. And honestly, let me say that um, folks have been really good about uh, sharing different ideas in the chat and different resources. And I just wanted to uh, reinforce to folks that uh, we will take all those things that have been shared in the chat and put those in the uh, summary sheet, but we'll also share that chat transcript. So I think uh, when we send out that follow-up email on Monday, that that's going to be a rich, rich um, place for uh, just teaching ideas and, and things like that. So uh, that's really fun. Uh, but yeah, we do have uh, some great questions. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and get started with those. And also let me remind folks that um, so the webinar technically ends at the uh, top of the hour. Uh, but Mike, if you could continue to share your screen, that would be great. So we just have that question slide up there. Oh, certainly. Sure. Um, we are um, going to stop at, the, or the webinar is scheduled to stop at the top of the hour. But uh, Mike has agreed to stay on and make sure everybody's questions are answered. We will stop taking questions at the top of the hour. So if you have a question for Mike, uh, now's the time to get those typed in. If you want to stick around and listen to hear what uh, Mike has to say, you're more than welcome to do that. But we'll stop taking questions in another couple of minutes. So our Great. first question, we had a couple of people ask. You talked about uh, having visitors in your um, conversation club. So they were wondering, are those visitors, are, are they like family members? Are they outside speakers? Are they people that are... Uh, just kind of drop in English language learners. Um, yeah, they, um, the, the, in the examples that I have used, um, these are people who um, have come in to maybe ask a survey. They, they are native English speakers uh, for the most part. They, they are people who uh, want to participate. They're inter I always tell them, you're welcome to come but one of the requirements is that you participate. Uh, so for example, um, they were going through an AARP uh, process and there's a local organization to make uh, Vero Beach a, a great place to live and be known as that. And we had someone come in and, and interact with the students and they had a great time. Um, so normally they are native English speakers and they may sometimes also be tutors uh, who, who want ideas about conversation. And, and as an example, I've also had people who are becoming teachers uh, who would like to observe uh, the class. So it, it's kind of a variety, but they're all uh, English uh, speakers. We also, um, I know Literacy Services uh, recorded uh, a clip of my conversation club to show to other potential students. So they don't actually, you know, because some folks are nervous about signing in to this type of an event. And um, that, that's, you know, that's the approach. Uh, I see the question, how many participate, participants in a group? Um, my class normally runs between six and 12. Um, and uh, right now, um, I have not, let's see, I'm trying to follow the questions here. I do not correct errors openly. Um, if they make an error, I may repeat their answer and do a slight correction. Um, but I do not try to do any kind of correction uh, on their part. Um, uh, you know, I do model uh, things if they're having pronunciation problems. Uh, I do model it that way. Um, uh, and uh, I, I use, uh, someone asked, how do you send the mass text? Hey, Mike. Yes. It's actually, it actually works better if I ask the questions. That way the question and the answer is on the recording. Sure. If you don't mind. And that way I can track and make sure everybody's question gets answered. I appreciate you uh, kind of going through those. So uh, let's go ahead. I think you were going to address the how do you send a mass text. So let's go ahead and um, um, answer that one. Yeah, I have a conversation club group on my phone and um, I copy and paste each text and I do it as a group uh, text. Uh, it's not 
I turned the, the group interaction setting off, but that way, you know, I, I have a distribution list essentially on my phone and it goes out that way. And I always use the same link. So, um, you know, they can, they can just sign up that way and, and come in. Perfect. There were um, some questions in the chat as well in the Q, as in the Q and A about getting students engaged. I know you said like it's not a problem. You have uh, your students are are uh, really engaged. But do you? Um, how would you encourage a shy or timid student to participate? Or let's say you had a beginning student uh, when a majority of the class is more advanced. Yes, sometimes what I, I have to do sometimes is I do ask my students to help another student. Um, because there can be, especially if they're a beginner, uh, there may be some um, comprehension problems. And at that time, I do allow uh, my students to help the other student. And, you know, a sentence or two. And, and then I ask them to respond in English. Um, but uh, you know, that is, can be a challenge, especially if they're a beginning student. And that's why I try to aim towards intermediate to advanced. Okay. Okay. So you kind of control that uh, with the, uh, you, the students that you invite in, you kind of control, you don't have too wide a uh, disparity in, in levels, it sounds like. Correct. The, uh, the staff of uh, literacy services uh, filters uh, the people who are coming in and they know who will be successful and they encourage uh, the ones um, who, you know, are fit. Perfect. I'm going to ask a follow up. Have you ever tried doing a conversation class with a, a lower level group of, of students? Uh, I, 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 yeah, I well not with for literacy services, um, but I have uh, in some of my other teaching. Okay. Fantastic, fantastic, and it, it worked well? Uh, it depends on the circumstance. Um, I think it comes down to whether you have a topic that is of key interest to them that they want to engage in. To me, okay. that, that's the secret. You, you have to find something that is really of interest to them or that they wanna do. And if they're real basic, it may need to be something fun. Okay. Okay, and there was a, a related question in the chat, I think, about do you ever, so in your video, it, you just kind of put a question out there and let people answer and let people talk all over, you know, over each other and uh, things like that. And you kind of identified uh, what you heard. And I heard a lot of people saying uh, that that was kind of how their classes worked. Uh, but we also had some questions. Do you ever call on like specific students to answer a question? Yes. Um, as I mentioned, this was in the um, kind of the earlier stage of the class. And um, what you what I normally do is, uh, as we proceed, I kind of do a round robin of calling on a specific student for that reason. Because I, I want, you know, I want to get them to giving from just giving a one or two word answer to having to answer in a sentence form. And that is kind of in the last half of the class that normally that I do more of that, uh, where I will ask a person, a specific student, a question. Okay. Okay. Um, we've got a couple more. Um, so one is, have you ever used a podcast in um, this is from um, Muna, or I think is how you pronounce uh, the first name. So if I don't contextualize this properly, uh, re-ask the question. But I think she's asking, do you ever use a podcast as like a, um, as a prompt to generate conversation? Uh, I have not um, specifically used a podcast. Uh, you know, if um, I have, I have used um, YouTube videos um, to kind of 
you know, start by discussing things. You know, they see some action, they hear some things, and then we may follow up. Uh, I'm trying to think, um, you know, we meet weekly, um, so there's a lot of content that we've gone through. I don't specific, specifically remember ever using a podcast, but certainly could. Okay. Okay. Um, do you ever assign homework to the, your students? Rarely. Um, if in, in some of the beginning students, it's probably more typical um, because I may say to them things like uh, literacy services uses mango. And if I think they need more remedial work, I may ask them to, uh, you know, do some of the lessons on mango, look for opportunities, talk to a neighbor. When you go to the store, start a conversation, um, you know, things like that. Um, but I do not normally um, assign homework. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, couple of questions. Do you, um, in terms of using Zoom, we have a couple of questions around that. Do you um, use the breakout rooms at all? Uh, you know, I have uh, tried the breakout rooms a few times for things, and that may be uh, a next level thing that I, I think I might try, uh, you know, maybe a debate kind of uh, topic where I break the class in half and I put half in one room and half in another room. Um, and then have them kind of prepare and do something. But I have not done that because uh, mainly uh, it's, it's another added technical challenge for one person to, um, at least it is for me, let's put it that way, to kind of be teaching and sharing and students coming in. And then I add the breakout room to that and it's, you know, and then someone comes in late or didn't hear the instructions. Uh, it, it just, I think it would probably add a complexity um, that I, I personally need to do some more preparation for. Sure, that makes sense. And do you think when you can resume in-person classes, will you just go back to doing in-person or do you think you'll kind of continue to Zoom, do Zoom classes? I intend on doing Zoom only. Okay. Oh, so you're just going to stick with Zoom no matter what? Yes. And why is that? There's several reasons. Um, and, and I alluded to some, some of them at, in the beginning. You know, in, in our locale, we have to reserve rooms at the library. We have a time period that we have to be there and the student has to come within that time period or we lose the room. Um, you know, they have to travel. They have to have transportation. Um, it, it, for me personally, it is certainly a lot simpler um, to, to do conversation um, through Zoom. And if there's anyone out there who would like to Zoom together their conversation club with ours. Um, I would certainly be willing to give something like that a try if anyone has an interest. Um, oh. Yeah, I think that's one of the I, I think that's one of the things that we've kind of heard from organizations is that uh, Zoom does overcome some of those traditional barriers like transportation and childcare and <coughs> excuse me things like that. Um, does, um, do you or does uh, literacy services charge for the conversation group or is it free? It's free. And when you have guest speakers, do you let the group know ahead of time that there's going to be a guest speaker like next week? Do you do any preparation for that guest speaker or do they just, you know, the guests, they just show up to class that day and wow, there's a guest speaker? The, the latter. They, they, they find out I do preparation uh, because what I generally want to do is I want to talk to that speaker. Um, I, I, I want to know who they are. I want to know why they're there. 
I want to know what their goal is. Um, and I also want to take the time to ask them some background questions to prepare uh, the 20 questions game, uh, as well as maybe some other context things that I can do with the students. Um, so uh, I, I, it's more that I need to do preparation work with that speaker. Because I may, like, you know, we had someone who brought in a survey and they wanted, um, they wanted, you know, input on 50 questions. And I said, well, I'll tell you what, how about if um, we take your 50 questions and we build them into a topic and we just let the students talk about this topic and then you can get your input. I'll make you a recording, uh, let's say, and, uh, and with the student's permission, and then you can get your input, you know, from that or a transcript of that. Great, great. We got a few more questions. Uh, you talked about error correction earlier, and I just want to get a clarification. So when you're correcting, doing error correction, do you just restate uh, correctly, or do you make a point of saying kind of the correct way to say that would be blah, blah, blah? I do not call out the error. Okay. I do not do anything to put the student in a position that could potentially uh, keep them from interacting. Um, I would prefer in a conversation club for them to feel um, total freedom in expressing themselves, whether it is correct or not. And if they ask, sometimes they may ask me how to say something. They may know the word, but they may need help saying it. And if that occurs and they kind of give me an in, I will spell out the word on chat and I will pronounce it for them. And we had this happen in this particular, later in this particular recording that you saw, uh, where the word was scale. Mm -hmm. at C A L E, and I they were having difficulty with it, and I typed it, and I said, "Is this word?" And they said, "Yes." And I said, and then I pronounced it for them. So okay. I, so I, I do not do anything to draw attention to their error. Okay. Um. Let's see, we've got uh, some questions about just kind of other tools. And I know you kind of gave a list of um, activities and resources. Uh, we have a question. Do you ever use any digital tools like Kahoot or some of those where you can kind of create games and quizzes and have the students uh, go out and respond to questions and then you can talk about their answers? Have you ever uh, used any of those? You know, I have seen those. Um, I, I have I have been on calls uh, describing those, and at least for my student population, um, I, I I I find that there's so many topics out there that for discussion that I generally don't need to use any of those tools. Um, I, I have I have tried them, um, but you know it. You know, it's extra preparation. It is, um, you know, it is another uh, um, kind of, it, it's not always uh, practicing um, the, uh, the, the skills that I try to encourage with them. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I've seen things with games and, and many other things. And I, I realize some conversation clubs take that philosophy. Um, I, I have instead, um, I like the art thing because sometimes you can spend more time trying to communicate the directions to something. Um, and, and it's just, you know, and then you have students coming in. Um, it's, it's easier just to have as they, if they come in in a staggered way, it's easier to kind of just have a topic that's ongoing as opposed to a game or another thing that's in progress. Yeah. A um, couple more questions. Um, you talked about kind of an impromptu uh, teaching approach. Uh, do you use a lesson plan? 
I do not. Um, I, well, I have an, uh, I have a concept mm -hmm. that, um, it may have been something I read. It may have been something I heard. Um, uh, I, I always try to have a topic in mind. Um, and, and I have these tools in how I will, um, kind of put it out there. Uh, but you know, during the pandemic, a lot of my time is initially is how are the students feeling? What's up with them? How is their day? You know, there's a lot of time that I spend just letting them talk a little bit. And, I, and sometimes we see where that takes us. And I find that impromptu approach more valuable to them than a lesson plan. And that's just me personally. I, I you know, I was taught to develop a lesson plan uh, when I went to Lotto. Um, but I uh, have, I don't use that uh, per se uh, in the conversation club. Okay, couple more questions. Um, uh, one is just how, do you ha ever have any issues with like a dominant student kind of taking over the conversation and others not being able to participate? That may happen in the beginning of the class. Um, but uh, it, it, it's it, that's why I call on the students in the later part of the class, and I may actually, you know, keep kind of even if someone speaks up, I may kind of let them know that okay, well, I'm I'm asking so and so this question, uh, you know, I, I want to see them to respond, and not to put down the other student, but just to kind of let the other student know that there's still an expectation that I want them to respond. So yes, th that does happen, um, but it, it, it's, it's rare. It, it's in a way that's helpful, not in a way that's disruptive. Great, great. And Mike, that is all of our questions. So uh, great uh, comments in the chat. Again, lots of people that, um, uh, sharing great ideas. So, uh, Mike, I just want to say thank you again for sharing with us and thank everyone for uh, attending and uh, everyone have a great rest of the day and a great weekend.